All right, you ready? The nation of Chad uh, is landlocked. It's right smack dab in the heart of Africa. If you are in Chad and you want to go to the ocean, it is a very, very long way. Uh, and honestly, that's the least of Chad's problems. Chad is one of the poorest countries on Earth. It's considered to be one of the most corrupt countries on Earth in terms of its government. It's been run by the same dictator for more than 25 years. Um, and, and the rest of the world, sadly, has never much cared, no matter how bad things were, or no matter how bad things got in the nation of Chad. But in the early 2000s, it suddenly became a huge, urgent deal with uh, of international concern that Chad was landlocked that Chad doesn't touch the sea it's already it's always been true but that became a huge new international crisis that all sorts of people were paying attention to in the early 2000s because in the early 2000s that is when Chad struck oil mm. and that changes everything usually it doesn't change things for the better but when one of the poorest countries on the planet, when Chad struck oil big time in the early 2000s, there was an effort to help them avoid the resource curse, to have Chad do it right. And so they made a deal. If, if Chad agreed that all of its soon to be new oil money, its new oil revenue, if they agreed that that money wouldn't just be taken by the dictator and his family. If, if they agreed that the dictator uh, wouldn't just use all the new oil money to build himself a big new army and buy lots of weapons to wage war on his enemies and keep himself in power. If, if Chad agreed to that, if Chad agreed to spend constructively for the benefit of the people of that country when it got its new oil money, then they would get this great deal. And that great deal would start with Chad no longer being landlocked. It would start with the oil companies building Chad a pipeline to the sea. Obviously, untapped oil gets drilled. The oil gets piped through the new pipeline to the sea so it can be shipped out to market. So the oil companies make a killing on that. The government gets a whole bunch of international aid as part of this deal. And of course, they get lots of new oil revenue. And because of the deal, the people of the country are guaranteed by the terms of this deal that all the new oil money, all these new oil revenues coming into the country, they won't just go into the dictator's pocket. They won't just turn into tanks and weapons. They'll be spent on things like education and hospitals and basic infrastructure to improve people's quality of life. And, and, and when you compare the numbers from before they started pumping the oil and after, Chad's GDP? quintupled within 10 years. But you know what happened there? Once all that money started flowing in, the dictator in Chad decided that he didn't actually really like this deal anymore. Because yeah, health and education for the people might be nice ideas for America and the World Bank, right, who are pushing this deal. But if you're a dictator in your second decade in charge, and you're planning on many more decades in charge, you may not be nearly as psyched as America is about, you know, prioritizing the education of your people over what is your priority, which in this case was weapons. He wants a bigger military. He wants more firepower. firepower. He wants more guns. Yeah, 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 there was this deal that you have to spend the money on education and hospitals and stuff. But if there really is a big faucet of oil money flowing into his country, what the dictator really wanted, what he really wanted for that money, what he really wanted to spend it on was guns. And that was prohibited by the deal. And so he threw the deal out the window. Forget the deal. Forget the World Bank and the United States that brokered the deal. You know, forget you, the deal's off. Or at least we're gonna do a new deal. And on August 26, 2006, the dictator of Chad told these two oil companies, told Chevron and Petronas, two of the three oil companies that were in on this giant deal, he told them they had to get out of Chad. In fact, he gave them one day to get out of Chad. He said they had to be gone within 24 hours. But it's interesting, he only kicked out two of the three companies that were pumping oil in his country. The other company, they could stay. Really? Yes. 
and say it with me now. That company was Exxon. Exxon basically told the dictator in chat, hey, listen, we're not the World Bank. We're not the United States. Do a deal with us, right? You get oil money from us pumping out your oil. We're not going to tell you where to spend it, how to spend it. Screw the deal that you had to make with these other people. You just deal with us. We'll get the oil. You can have the cash. Call the deal off. You can, you know, pay off whatever loans you agreed to as part of this deal. We're happy for your business. We're Exxon. We'll take your oil. We will give you money for your oil. And then once you've got that money, you get your guns or whatever it is you want. And that whole Exxon move, that all happened in 2006. That happened right after this guy took over as the head of Exxon. This deal in Chad. Screw the US government. Screw what the United States of America is trying to accomplish in that part of Africa in that critical part of the world. Chad borders Libya and Nigeria and Sudan, right? <laughs> screw whatever that little country means to the United States and screw whatever that other little country, the United States, is trying to do here. Get out of the way. There's money to be made here for Exxon. And now, more than a dozen years into its new life as an oil producing nation, if you look at the Human Development Index of nations, um, Chad ranks fourth from the bottom out of 188 countries. Remember I said their GDP quintupled? Didn't do much for the people. Fourth from the bottom. There's 188 countries ranked, they're 185th. Chad is also officially considered to be a failed state. Chad remains one of the 10 poorest nations on earth. It remains one of the most corrupt nations on earth. In fact, the single poorest inhabited region on Earth uh, is a part of Chad, a region in Chad that's called Salamat. See down in the lower, lower east, southeast corner there? Salamat, the poorest region on the face of the globe that is inhabited by humans. And Salamat is just a hop, skip, and a jump from Exxon's largest oil field in Chad. But Exxon is doing great in Chad. Their latest corporate report says that just in that one field in Chad that's next to the poorest region on the face of the earth, they're producing 29 million barrels of oil. And under the new deal that Exxon cut, that, that oil flow out of the ground in Chad, which has been so good for Exxon, it has led to Chad's dictator spending at least $4 billion on weapons. And that is something that the United States government saw coming and tried to prevent because it is not in the interest of the United States. The reason it happened anyway is because it was in the interests of Exxon. And Exxon has its own foreign policy that is frequently at odds with the United States. And that foreign policy is the only foreign policy with which our new nominee for Secretary of State has any experience whatsoever. Um, there was also starting to be some attention to the fact that while American soldiers were fighting and dying in Iraq um, to try to stand up an Iraqi government that could hold that country together after we deposed Saddam, while American soldiers were fighting and dying in Iraq to stand up an Iraqi government that can hold that country together, Exxon defied an explicit request from the U.S. government to please only work with the government in Baghdad. Exxon responded to that request from the U.S. government by saying, screw that. In effect, who cares what American soldiers are dying for? We're going to do our own deal, our own oil deal, with just the Kurdish government in the northern part of Iraq, because that may be terrible for America, but that's easier for us. But what he has actually been, in country after country, in story after story, in war after war, in deal after deal, what he's actually been really is an adversary of the United States. Exxon has its own foreign policy. They compete with America. I mean, in, in lots of places, Exxon is anti-American. Exxon under Rex Tillerson has frequently and repeatedly and reliably actively worked to oppose the interests of the United States of America. In countries large and small, even in countries where we are actively at war, even in countries most Americans couldn't find on a map.